Les humains à leur meilleur. C'est toi pour Hero. All right, everyone, we have a special episode today. We're lucky to hear all about Mickey's new paper looking at the complete story of our dietary past and humans being high trophic level carnivores. He gave me a sneak peek at this awesome 40 page paper he's submitting for review. Mickey Bendor got an undergraduate and master's degree in economics and then went back to school later in life to study paleoanthropology. He is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Archaeology of Tel Aviv University. You can find some of his great presentations on YouTube and also his paper, Man the Fat Hunter, published in 2011. Love the work he's done. He's hit it from all angles and it all lines up. We ain't meat for all of human history. Okay, here's a bit of business to take care of. Let's see how concise we can make it. Get your own grass-finished meat at nosetotail.org. Support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash peakhuman. Pre-order the film at foodlies.org. Watch highlights from the film on the Food Lies YouTube. Get daily content on the Food Lies Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Sign up for the newsletter on saping.org. Get on the waiting list if you're a health coach, doctor, or other healthcare practitioner for our health technology at sapien.org. Well, I think there's too many things at this point. Maybe just pick one of these and go for it. I really appreciate it. At this point, we're a community-powered company. We're scrambling around here at Sapien trying to make this all happen without outside money or influence. Really love this tribe. We can't go back to the glory days thrusting spears at woolly mammoth and gorging on fatty meat, but we can still try to bring the community together and spread the word and focus on our own health and the health of people around us. Now let's hear from Mickey Bendor. Okay, well, there's so much to talk about. Thanks for coming on, Mickey Bendor. There's, you have an undergraduate degree and master's degree in economics, and then you switch later in life into paleoanthropology and kind of found your true passion and have done so much research on so many interesting things that we're going to dive into today. So thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Yeah, so you're over, you're the Department of Archaeology at the Tel Aviv University? Right, I'm doing a postdoc there. Okay, yeah. So you have a great paper you published called Man the Fat Hunter. So just to start off, we know he looked into you know our ancient past and found that we were always seeking fatty meat. So we're going to get into that. And now you have a new paper that hasn't been published yet, but you sent me. And I'm so excited to read it. It's 40 pages. I've gone over almost all of it. And there's 12 pages of references. So <laughs> there's a lot going on. Right, it's really a tour de force of uh, reconstructing a human trophic level, which is another way of saying how much animal, uh, what was the part, the relative part of the animal food in relation to plant food in this diet. Yeah, that's such an interesting story to figure out. It's so hard to figure out because the evidence is sparse. So let's dive into all of that. And then also, I mean, you have great presentations on YouTube. You've been on other podcasts, so... People should check him out otherwise, but let's get in here. Well, first of all, did you, some people are, are so into carnivore these days. I feel like they're so into eating meat and then they backtrack into making all these arguments that we were carnivore. But I think you just were looking at data and did it the other way around. Do you even eat all meat? Yeah, I do. Now I do. That just, uh, I would say in the last half a year or so. Yeah. Mm. But before that, you were just a normal diet or a paleo-style diet? Of course, before I was paleo, I was a normal diet. But my interest in hunter-gatherers and uh, our ancestors uh, didn't start with the diet at all. Uh, so it started with more of the behavioral background, some explanation that, that hunter-gatherers could give me about the present-day difficulties that we have. So I think that we are like uh, really evolutionary speaking hunter gatherers who are uh, find ourselves in in a very strange place and consequently take a lot of time to figure out a lot of effort to figure out or to, or to actually function in an environment that is completely strange to our genes. So yeah, from that I wrote a book and I started. I, I said I, I know about paleo, but I didn't really care too much about it. 
And then I said, okay, let me write a, a chapter about uh, nutrition. And then I, I found out about this, how bad the present recommendations are. And this really what brought me to go into paleo. You said uh, depression. No, I didn't have depression, no. No, no, you said that. You're talking about depression? I, no, no, I was not talking about depression at all. I'm just, oh, I, I, I couldn't hear you. What was that word? No, no, what was the word that the recommendations were bad for? Oh, I, I'm talking about the guidelines, about the nutritional guidelines. Oh, just dietary. Sorry, I thought you yeah, said the depression. dietary guidelines, nutrition. exactly. This yeah, is the yeah, word yeah. I was looking for. When I started reading, you know, Gary Taubes and things like that and, and finding out how terrible they are, then I, I, <laughs> yeah. switched, I switched to paleo. But, you know, my interest in hunter-gatherer is, is, uh, started before that and it had nothing to do with food. So, exactly. And so a lot of your stuff is based on how our genes developed in a much different environment than we're living in today. And also, I want to point out before we even start is we're talking about like a time scale that's so different than what humans can really grasp. And it's hard for us to figure out because we're kind of basing things in the last 20 years or, oh, maybe the last 50 years. So this is why my grandma ate or we need to talk about the last two million years of, of what humans ate. And that's so different. That's 99.9% you know, of our history compared to just the last thousand years. So absolutely, our stomach, uh, our uh, you know all that, all the structure of our uh, morphology, gut morphology, developed over the last two million years. It's not changing in the last ten thousand years. It's not changing. It's same, maybe, maybe changing marginally in ten thousand years. But but basically, most of our evolution, almost all of it, happened in the last two million years. And uh, whatever we are going through, uh, and there is of course some uh, evolution that's still happening. Uh, it will always happen, but uh, relatively speaking, it's minor. So if mm -hmm. we want to, to study, or if we want to learn, if we want to understand, uh, we need to go over the last two million years. Yeah. So in your paper, you look at a lot of the physiological evidence for you know what trophic level carnivores we are. So human trophic level means there's a food chain and how high we are in that food chain is how high our trophic level is. And then there's also a bunch of archaeological and paleontological evidence that people may not be as familiar with. But start with the gut morphology part, because some people may have heard this. It's like, well, vegans say, hey, we're like primates. like We're like our chimp ancestors. We're supposed to be eating plants all day. That's what we still should be doing. So why is that not true? Oh, boy. this is a, We basically have a gut morphology that is very similar to carnivores. It's not identical because uh, we are coming from a long line of uh, omnivores. but uh, Basically, what happened when we, if you compare us to chimpanzees, is that we have, and I've, I've calculated it, to be like 77% less or smaller column, yeah, and about 60-something mm -hmm. percent longer small intestines. And mm -hmm. this is exactly the, the direction of carnivores. Carnivores have small column and large uh, small uh, intestines. That's because it's how they digest the food is different, and the different. That's because of the food is different. If the, uh, because most most animals, by the way, most animals that are not carnivores, really uh, get a lot of their energy and maybe sometimes most of their energy from fiber. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is cows, of course. We know even the uh, chimpanzees. Uh, I've calculated that they get over fifty percent of their of their energy from fiber. The fruit that they are eating is full of fiber. Uh, it's mm -hmm. something that we will not be able to eat if we try it. It's so fibrous. So they are getting and the way for humans or any animal to get energy from fiber is to let the uh, bacteria uh, work on the fiber, digest it, and uh, we enjoy the sort of waste product of that uh, process, mm -hmm. yeah. which the is the yeah. short fat, short chain uh, saturated fatty acid. Yep. When our column is getting 77% shorter, it means that significance or the importance of plant food is diminishing substantially because in nature, most plant food have very high degree of fiber. And on the other hand, uh, like most carnivores, we have longer small intestines. And this is small intestines is where the fat and the protein and the sugar, as well as sugar, uh, get uh, absorbed. 
But the sugar doesn't require a lot of uh, area to get absorbed. Protein and fat require longer contact area with the, yeah, with yeah. the small intestines. This is why the carnivores have, although they don't consume sugar, they still have a very long small intestines. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, there is no question. If you just uh, there is no question whatsoever that we have developed in a direction of uh, a high degree of carnivore. Uh, yeah. You can even look at our stomachs, the size of our stomachs, the size of these. Right, the size is another, yeah, it's another point. They're giant, they're giant, and we have thin, flat stomachs. What about the gut pH? The gut pH is another uh, uh, point, and this is really very convincing. Animals have a gut pH that more or less line up with, uh, with their nutrition. Let's say uh, herbivores, uh, not very acidic uh, stomach, right? Omnivores have more acidic stomach. Carnivores have very acidic stomach. And scavengers have a very, very acidic stomach. And the reason is because of the, uh, the one of the duties of the, of the acidity is to fight pathogens. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that humans have actually scavenger level of acidity. And this is not, not a small business because to produce the acidity, you need you to consume a lot of energy and to maintain that acidity in the vessel, yet in the stomach, you need to replace the, the, the lining of the stomach continuously. This is the evolution didn't do it just for fun. Uh, it, yeah. means, it means that- It's a very expensive were, evolutionary process. Yeah, very expensive. So the explanation that I could come up with is why we have, why we are not, if we are carnivores, why we don't have a carnivore level? Well, we are a special kind of carnivore. We are a carnivore that takes the animal, doesn't leave it where he found it or, or killed it, but take it to a central place and consume it, or consume it if it's large enough over many days. For multiple reasons. One is we needed to protect ourselves from other animals and also we had bigger animals and we had, you know, lived in caves and, and it took Absolutely. a lot longer to eat. Yeah, yeah. We used to hunt big animals, right? And of course we had competition. You know, uh, lions and uh, hyenas, they eat very quickly because they don't uh, have a lot of time because other animals are coming. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't. We cannot eat quickly. Our strategy was to actually protect the animal, cut it to pieces, and transport it to a central place and guard it there. And actually, we are kind of a scavenger carnival. So that's why we have this acidity. Yeah, and just to put in some numbers, we have a city of 1.5, our pH. Carnivores are, you know, 2.2, and omnivores, what is it, is 2.9, and some herbivores are like 6 or 7. Yeah, yeah, this is more or less. The six, something like 6, yeah, 5, 6. 6, 6, 5, yeah. 6, yeah, that's right. Yes. So... Yeah, that's really interesting. The one that you thought was most interesting is the adipocytes or fat metabolism. What, what I liked about the adipocytes morphology, okay? Adipocytes are the fat cells, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is like a paper that I found from 1985. Nobody paid attention to it, Pond and Matax. And they, they found out omnivores have uh, a smaller number of bigger cells, okay, of mm -hmm. fat, whereas carnivores have a higher number of smaller cells, uh, holding the same amount of fat, yeah? So mm. you can hold it in a smaller number of bigger cells and a higher number of smaller cells. And humans are an extreme case of carnivore in this respect, with very high number of very small cells. They finished their paper, and this is 1985, nobody was arguing, no vegans, nothing, no wars. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is, I just want to read the a site, for, a site from, their, from their paper. They say, this figure suggests that the energy metabolism of humans is adapted to a diet in which lipids and protein, rather than carbohydrates, make a major contribution to the energy supply. This is something nobody thought about it, nobody knew about it. And it's always like that. If you have the right hypothesis, the proof comes from all directions that you, you never expected. So this was, I was so happy to find this one. That's uh, great. And again, that's Pond's 1985, and I'll link to it in yeah. the show notes.
yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, and just saying, she, it looks, it sounds like she, uh, they were surprised themselves to find that out. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe no one thought about this. This whole thing that humans can just eat meat is such a new concept. Yeah. I feel like until Sean Baker went on Joe Rogan. In December of 2017, people in the mainstream didn't even know it was possible, and neither did I. <laughs> yeah, no, this is a really surprising. I mean, I've been paleo and keto for almost 10 years now, and uh, never occurred to me that the best, the best, or the most efficient, or in many in many respects, could be uh, only meat. Yeah, it is weird. Yeah. Well, let's go back. Okay, let's kind of start from Homo erectus. Let's talk about their brain size and Homo erectus. And, you know, they're around for 1.5 million years. Yeah, this is the longest species, the longest uh, species of humans that ever lived. Yeah, about 1.5 million years. They started about 2 million years ago, 1.9 million years ago, 1.8 million years ago. And their brain was in the range between 700 and uh, 900 1,000 uh, uh, cc compared to, uh, let's say, the, uh, the previous species or older species of Homo habilis, which has about 650 cc. In my, in my uh, book, uh, they are the first Homo. They are the first mm-hmm. clear Homo. And I'm not sure that if uh, we saw uh, a Homo erectus uh, walking somewhere with a suit, that we would actually mm-hmm. think that he is not human. Yeah. With them, what, what happens is that you see an increase in the, in the findings of uh, bones and stone and more advanced stone tools. So the researchers that are actually digging their sites, most of them come up with the, with the conclusion that they were carnivores. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons is because they find access to the choiciest parts of the animal, okay, it's first axis. In other words, the cut marks of the stone tools on the bones, and there's no teeth, you know, in mm. marks uh, from, from. So that was mark. a change. That was a change. That means we developed these hunting methods that we could get to the animal. We think initially our ancestors were scavengers and we had to get it after the yeah, that's predator probably true. got it. That's probably true. Yeah. We probably started the scavengers, especially scavenging on bones which not many animals can utilize, but we with the stone could uh, sort of break and, and get access to the... To the, the bone marrow. Yeah, bone marrow, the yeah. bone marrow has a lot of fat in it. And people think the brain too, we could eat other brains and get omega-3 DHA. You know, Brian, while, while we are on bone marrow, let me tell you, I think that one of the main differences between today's uh, diet and the uh, paleo diet is bone marrow. These mm-hmm. guys were eating bone marrow like crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, I know they were breaking bones every side, have these broken bones that they are clearly broken to get the marrow. I did the yeah. experiment uh, with the cow bones in, in one of the, with some, some archaeologists. And it's so easy to break and get a very large piece of uh, bone marrow and to eat it raw is fantastic. So I think that the, if you want to be paleo, if you want to eat bone mm-hmm. marrow. Well, yeah. I mean, I talked to Dr. Paul Saladino a lot about this and that we have to be nose to tail carnivores or, or just eat nose to tail in general and get all this stuff. I mean, even the glycine to methionine ratio, just because there's different things in the bone marrow that we're not getting if you're just eating muscle meat. And I personally eat bone broth, drink bone broth every day. Right. The, uh, another part is, of course, liver. I mean, oh, liver is so easy. It's so easy to eat. There are uh, there is evidence that this is when humans get into a, an animal. First of all, they you know they take the liver with their hands and and they eat it like that. That's another reason too. We thought that once we got first access, then we got access to the liver because the right. predator would eat the liver first as well. The lion right. eats the liver right away because right. every right. animal knows instinctively it's the most nutritious. So yeah. So yeah, keep going with that. So we, our brain, so, you so have the, a, maybe, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the Homo erectus had, of course, a large brain compared to, nobody knows exactly who was his uh, ancestor. Whether well, Homo habilis was an ancestor to Homo erectus, probably not. But it's possible. Nobody knows. 
Actually, nobody knows if uh, Homo erectus was our ancestor in our line of ancestry, but it's, it's possible and maybe even probable. So he had a larger brain. Now the question is, why would he need a large brain? The theory, and this is not my theory, this is uh, already Stanford and, and Boone, the, the large brain was needed to, for hunting mm-hmm. because you don't need larger brain to collect a more uh, underground storage organs, right? To collect more plants. Uh, yeah, the tubers, yeah. otherwise known as tubers, yes. Right, right. Potatoes so tubers, type yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, and roots, whatever. You don't need a large brain to collect them. So uh, the theory, and I think it's quite accepted, is that the large brain was needed for hunting. Well, yeah, which came first? More nutritious foods or the large brain for hunting? Or they go hand in hand? And, you know, there's other theories too. There's, he's talking about we had more access to marine foods with more DHA, but then you can disprove that. Uh, (laughs) You talked about it, right? (laughs) Uh, I find it, I find this theory strange that we had more access to marine and all that stuff. Why would they have more access to marine? Why, all of a sudden, the, the marine life has started to flourish? I mean, <laughs> no. Well, I, and I, there's, million, there's millions of landlocked people even today. I think this right. is what you mentioned in your paper. There's billions of pe- landlocked people that don't eat any omega-3 any their fish, whole life. Or, any fish. Yeah, I mean, the, any the, there is a paper about the Indians in Alberta, I think, and there are rivers there with fish, and they don't touch the fish. They just don't touch the fish. They don't eat fish. They, yeah. they of course, they have bisons. And they used to, yeah, have bisons, etc. But they just don't eat the fish. And there's no, no, no. I mean, also the, if you saw, in, I have a chapter about the isotopes, and the mm-hmm. isotope, stable isotope research can identify a marine uh, you know, food consumption. Yeah, yeah, with the collagen, yes. Yeah, but, when you but, look at that. But, but if you look at the results, this uh, marine food consumption came very late, uh, very late. I mean, like maybe twenty thousand years ago. Uh, we are talking about two million years ago. No, mm-hmm. no, I don't see any logic in it at all. I don't understand why this uh, hypothesis continues to survive and papers are written about it. I don't know. Billions of people are having a brain that is uh, maybe 50% uh, larger than that of uh, uh, Homo erectus without any supply of uh, DHA. So Yeah, there's lots of theories and maybe there was a small a contribution there at some point, but it, you don't need it for one thing. And then there's also theories on, I've read a book, you know, it's the communication is what drove our brains. But I mean, I think that's to do with the hunting. It's we learn to communicate because we needed to hunt and we learned to track animals and this stuff was very Look, complicated. how evolution works. Let's say a little story, okay? The forest starts to disappear and the savanna uh, start to appear. Savanna is a type of landscape where there is more herbivore biomass than there would have been in forest. Okay, mm-hmm. forests are more, they're more like plant biomass and on savanna, there's more animal biomass. Yeah. So those individuals that had a little better uh, brain or a little better cognitive capacity mm-hmm. managed to survive by getting access to meat, okay? Mm-hmm. So first of all, getting access to bones. And then by uh, coming up with this idea that you can take, you can take a, a stone and break the bone and get the marrow. Mm-hmm. So those that had the larger brain or the better cognitive capacity survive. The next generation and the next generation, and as the savanna developed and the plant food disappeared, whoever could not be smart enough to obtain animal food just didn't take, continue, didn't have uh, kids. So this mm-hmm. is it. This yeah. is how uh, the evolution works. Very Absolutely. And, and there's a little piece in here I want to throw in this too, is, is throwing rocks. I read a great book called The Social Leap by William Von Hippel talking about, and this kind of ties into other sort of morphological things and evidence on why we became meat eaters and hunters is that we would, we developed the ability to throw, humans have a great ability to throw things, throw spears, throw rocks. We can throw much, much 
Oh, no. Yeah, and the first before we even developed spears or any technology, right. uh, this guy was talking about how we would congregate and throw rocks at animals at the predators to get them away so that we could scavenge. Absolutely, absolutely. There's, by the way, one uh, theory that uh, humans use acacia uh, tree. You know the acacia tree, uh -huh. which has thorns. Okay, so you can you can cut a, a, a branch of acacia tree. And actually use that to sort of protect yourself. Mm, yeah. So the, if, you're, if you're smart enough and you can cut it, uh, how many animals can cut it, it, uh, a branch and, and manipulate it? And, and you know, we, we had uh, plenty of possibilities and, plenty, and quite a big advantage. And by the way, I think it's quite important to say that to hunt large animals is not that difficult. Actually, yeah. it's much more difficult to hunt smaller animals because smaller animals escape and they are small and they are fast. So large animals, you can hunt an elephant using wooden spears, okay? Mm -hmm. If you get enough people to corner and you get the right place, okay? Like a ravine or something, you get the right, like a canyon, a place to, to sort of limit their ability to, yeah. to escape then you can actually kill it with stones and with uh, spears. And there are many ways. You can dig a hole, cover it with uh, leaves, okay, mm -hmm. branches and leaves, because these uh, elephants, they go to the water, they need to drink, and they go in the same routes. They use the same routes all the time. So it's not that difficult to hunt larger animals. Actually, it's more difficult to hunt smaller animals. This is super interesting because you have the whole theory and kind of write about this in your paper about and concerning Neanderthals as well and how they died off and how easy it is to well they never had to develop the technology to hunt smaller animals because there were so many big animals and it was so easy to hunt them. Yeah, that, that's the theory I have about why the Neanderthal went extinct is because the, at that time the extinction of large animals took place. It's called the late quaternary megafauna extinction. It started about 50,000 years ago. By about 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthals were gone. They were really like a predator of large animals. They were very heavy and robust. Thick so bones, the, yeah. So the, the, in comparison to humans, they consumed more energy just moving from one place to another. And so they were really dependent. I won't go to, into the details, but they were actually like a like a carnivore that is dependent on large animals. And when the large oh, yeah, there's animals... A, there's a paper on it too. Do you know the name of the paper if someone wants to look at it? I forget the name of the paper about the... They looked at the isotope data and found that Neanderthals were high-level trophic carnivores. It's like confirmed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No, that, no there's not only one paper. There, there are quite a few, actually. Uh, the last one is from uh, Wissing or Wissing. I'm not sure how you... It's spelled W-I-W-I... Mm. -Y Double S I N. Yeah, yeah. Christoph Wissing. I have one of them open. Stable isotopes reveal patterns of diet and mobility in the last Neanderthals and first modern humans in Europe. This is actually a different paper that's interesting to talk about too, if you want to. Yeah, that's another paper. And uh, that paper actually claimed Neanderthals and humans actually consumed or competed for the same animals. And yeah. They say large animals. So we lived at the same time. There was this big overlap for hundreds of thousands of years. No, 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 no. The Neanderthals and the humans, the overlap was a few thousand years. Oh, a few thousand years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In Europe, humans arrived, I mean, modern humans. I, can, I think Neanderthals were also humans. But modern humans arrived in Europe about 45,000 years ago. And the Neanderthal went extinct about 40,000 years ago. So 5,000 years. And by the way, there is not a single site where you have a layer of modern human below a layer of Neanderthal. In other mm. words, they were not sharing the same landscape, the same territory, as far as is known. I mean, maybe we will still find something, mm -hmm. but as far as we know, they were not really sharing the same landscape or the same territory, but the as the Neanderthal retreated, more than human came. And that is the question, whether it was competition or whether it just would have happened to the Neanderthal anyway because of the disappearance of the large animals. Okay, he yeah. was weak. There's no question about it. They started 
the disappearance of large animals started 50,000 years ago. So by the time the humans arrived 45,000 years ago, already there was a diminished quantity or density of larger animals. So the Neanderthal, as far as I'm concerned, was already in quite uh, in difficulty. Yeah, so, so I cited the opposite. There was a small overlap, is what I should say. Yeah, yeah, there was a fair 5,000 years. It's not a big, you know, yeah, term, yeah. it's not a big overlap. But still, they have, uh, as we know, they managed to uh, procreate or whatever. Yeah, we are know that we have some of their DNA. Yeah, they had enough time. It took them 5,000 years, but you know, slowly yeah. but surely. Well, so, okay, so we paint us a picture a bit on what humans were eating back in this time period when, and how big the animals were. Well, humans, uh, one of their characteristics is that they eat from animals that weigh one kilo to animals that weigh 6,000 kilos. Mm -hmm. So they are eating all kinds of animals. And I want to say something very important. They ate plants. They ate mm -hmm. plants for these two million years. They did eat plants. Mm -hmm. You find plants in the teeth, you find plants on the as residues on the stone tools. So there is no question at all that humans ate plants. The only Absolutely. question is how much. Mm -hmm. Now, a hyper carnivore yeah, is defined as a carnivore that eats 70 to 80 percent of its uh, food from animals. Mm -hmm. Okay? A hyper carnivore doesn't have to have. Uh, you know, a hundred percent meat diet. Yeah, it sounds like so meat. That's what I do. <laughs> you do like eighty percent. Yeah, I do like eighty percent. I mean, if you do it by calories, sometimes it might be like ninety-five percent. I mean, these plant foods don't have many calories when you're looking comparing it to yeah, meat. So. Yeah, you know, yeah, but so and then also, eat, yeah, uh, rice and potatoes. Yeah. No, no, yeah, you don't need. Yeah, I just think it's some people get too crazy in the carnivore world, and they're like, "You got to go 100% carnivore." I'm like, "No, I mean, we did. There's tons of evidence. We ate plants. You're just saying it's it's more of our fallback foods, our survival foods, or a supplementary food, or maybe it was in the stomach of the animal, stuff like that." Yeah, I have a theory about it, but you know, we won't finish if I tell you all my theory. <laughs> so no, coming from economics. Everything is, a, you learn one word for three years in economics, you learn one word, alternative. Mm -hmm. Okay, everything has to be judged by its alternative. Mm -hmm. Now you get a, a woman, okay, hunter together one and a half million years ago, one million years ago. What is the alternative or, of her time? In other words, she's not going to go hunting. Her job, mm -hmm. and this is, by the way, one of the things that uh, is unique for humans is that this div division of labor. Mm, between yeah. the sexes. It was very important for our survival. So the first job of the woman is to guard the children. But still, it ca she can probably spend some time gathering food. Okay, so she doesn't have any other alternative. Although gathering plants is a return is in the thousands of calories per hour and compared to tens of thousands of calories of hunting, Still, the alternative, she doesn't have that alternative of hunting. Mm. However, yeah. when she gathers, she gathers also lizards, you know, other, like other turtles. Yeah, this smaller animals as well as yeah. roots. So, yes, they did consume plants, but none of the plants that they consume you'll find in a supermarket today. Mm, yeah. So, if we go back to the paleo template, you know, if you want to be sure, if you want to be safe, eat the 80%. Uh, fat and meat, of course, uh, yeah. and this is safe, uh, as safe as you can get. It's there's many things there. Yeah, for one, that most plants are toxic to us. You're kind of saying, and still they are today. I mean, yes, we've bred them, but a lot of plants still have these different things like oxalates and lectins and stuff. So, and even if we did collect those plants, we figured out ways to prepare them too. This is sort of the tangent, but yes, we plants were sort of a labor intensive non-ideal source of calories uh, they actually weren't even preferred if we want to start talking about a whole different topic because this kind of leads into the optimal foraging theory because i had stefan guiana on and mm -hmm. he's trying to say you know we should be eating mostly plant foods and that you know he's taking a look at the hadza like this modern hunter-gatherer tribe and just taking a look at what they do and then saying that that's what we did for all of history <laughs> which you have a big problem with i'll, I'll let you talk about that I tell you, the Hadza for, for diet reconstruction is like, uh, you know, observation studies for nutrition. 
Yeah. This is something that is sure to lead you to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> yeah. The Hadza live in an environment that is completely different in terms of uh, the density of animals compared to what the Paleolithic uh, was. We started the Pleistocene, which is two and a half million years ago, with animals that uh, weighed 12 tons. Uh, yeah, 24,000 pounds. 24,000 well, pounds. 24,000 <laughs> yeah. pound elephant. Today, uh, the elephant weighs about 4,000. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's 4,000 tons. So what? About Four uh, tons, 8,000 uh, pounds. About 9,000 pounds. Yeah. Right? And the average size of these terrestrial animals was 500 kilos, two and a half million years ago. So you had a lot of large species of large animals. Today, this average or mean is 10 kilos, 98% less than what it was two and a half million years ago. So today, the richness of large animal species is meager to compared to what, so Homo erectus worked in a savanna that was steaming with large animals. You need some imagination. I mean, uh, to go, and now I understand people that go, you know, look at the Hadza and live with them and see that they can survive on, on honey, etc. But that's completely different environment. Large animals, especially elephants, change the environment completely. They actually create the savanna. They pull down trees. Anyway, they're, I won't go into it, but they... No, you can talk about it a little bit. They hate those certain trees that are everywhere now that the Hadza use for food, the bobal. Baobab. Yeah, the baobab. Baobab. Yeah, the baobab is a source of about 40% of the Hadza's calories. The seeds, the fruit, actually the bees, most of the bees, that, the honey that they get is they get from, from bees that live in the baobab tree. Where there are elephants, there are very, very few baobab trees. They are known in Africa as baobab predators. Okay, they don't like baobab around. Uh, so now, not only the mean body weight of, uh, of terrestrial animals went down to 10, to 10 kilos, but in the territory of the Hadza, you cannot find a rhino, a rhinoceros, and you cannot find a, almost no elephants. Okay, so mm -hmm. the large animals, even that the, those that actually uh, remained in Africa are not available for the Hadza. So these Hadza, on the other hand, they are using iron. Iron, instead of stone tools, it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, but you can, you can use a little bit of imagination to imagine how much time humans in the Paleolithic spend on this uh, stone economy. You have to go get the stone, you have to shape it, and it doesn't last for long. You have to make another tool and another tool, and you have to carry it. It's a completely different... Uh, and this Hadza had, had iron for, the, for over, almost 500 years because the farmers around them, and they are around, You know, most of the Hadza speak two languages. That's how much they are connected to the farmers around them. Mm. So this is a point saying that they hunted smaller animals now. So just now to be clear, the odds are still... Of course, now they're hunting smaller animals. Yeah. And they're hunting, you know, they, they dig in the ground and they get these uh, smaller animals. And they use iron for bows and arrows. Okay, bows and arrows is a new invention in terms of, uh, you know, paleolithic. It's about maybe 50,000, 60,000 years old. It's not that much. Humans didn't, but also didn't the, have bow and arrow. Yeah, this is also the point that before, for 99% of human history, we didn't have bow and arrows, and we hunted these large animals. Their only defense mechanism was turn and face. You know, these are these large, slow animals that were easy to hunt with these stone tools, and it was all based around this limited technology we had, and that's all we focused on. We had spears, wooden spears, and later on, the, you see wooden spears with the tips, Okay, so mm -hmm. they added stone tips. So you assume these spears were thrown. Okay, and also you have the, of course, the shoulder evolution to throw. So yes, but in my opinion, I mean, mm -hmm. Homo sapiens with the brain of about 1400 cc, 350 cc, uh, appeared in Africa about 300,000 years ago. Okay, bow and arrow appeared maybe 80, 70, 60,000 years ago. Now, 
you want to tell me that, that with such a large brain, it took him 120,000 years to develop bow and arrow? No. In my opinion, they just didn't need it. Right. Yes, that's so interesting right. because we had so, so many large, see the bow easy and arrow to get developing. Out. And by the way, one of so the cool. one of the theories about the Neanderthal extinction or the humans uh, or modern human advantage is that we had the technology to hunt smaller animals, and we came with that technology to Europe. Yeah, and mm-hmm. the and the Neanderthal didn't have the technology. Why didn't they have the technology? He was stupid. No, you know his brain was actually larger than, larger than ours. Okay, maybe different shapes, or maybe he had some some uh, functions that yeah, are, yeah. were large, uh, better and others that were not. But it's not that he couldn't make the bow and arrow. He just didn't need the bow and arrow because he was hunter of large animals. Yeah? We just wanted fatty so, meat and we could get it easily. Yeah, so the Hadza, <laughs> the Hadza really is, is, a, is a problem. It's a problem. I actually have a paper uh, to be submitted that discuss exactly that. How ethnographic record uh, which is the Hadza, the sun, is not, cannot be used to reconstruct Paleolithic diet. Cannot be used. Yeah, no, this is really important. I looked at this ethnographic atlas and Lauren Cordain uses a lot and build our theories of what the Paleolithic man ate. And even so, he still did find that it was mostly animal foods and that none of them relied on only plant foods. It was mostly animal foods. But still, right. this was all based right. on just our modern hunter-gatherers. Yeah. You can't use that for all of history. It doesn't make any sense. A lot of use of analogy with ethnographic data because, uh, you know, it, it helps. It helps to live with hunter gatherers that are having the same, more or less the same way of life that our ancestors had and uh, find, you know, and use it to sort of understand what, how our ancestors lived. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, uh, usage of this, of this analogy. But there are two, two conditions for this analogy that are known. One is that the ecological situation is identical, hopefully. And another is that the technology is identical. Mm-hmm. And in the case of the sun and the Hadza, none of them is identical. They are as far, as, as far away from each other as can be. <laughs> yeah, they're both. So the use of analogy is really yeah. not professional. It's not professional at all. It's crazy, but so many people will just use it because it fits their narrative. They just think that we these plants are these magical foods, and that I tell you, it's and, diff- it's then they just use this data to, to show that otherwise. to try to confirm that. You go there, and these Hadza, they're naked and they're running around, and they eat mostly plants. So I say, okay, look, it's possible. Yeah, it's possible if the environment is different, <laughs> and if you have uh, different technology, you have dogs. You know, dogs are also very recent phenomena, maybe 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years at the most. Dogs, you know, the sun won't go Mm -hmm. to hunt uh, pigs without dogs. They just say it's impossible. It's just not, it's just, Mm -hmm. but I understand why it happens because it's so apparent. You come and you see them, you know, they dress like uh, our ancestors and uh, they look like what we imagine to be our ancestors. Yeah, I can see why, but you, you just need to think about it a little longer and it doesn't work. Okay, so where do we go from here? So the, Look, what's the next step? What I did in the paper, in I, did, I did the, you know, I took like maybe 10 or, or a little bit more cases like this, uh, like the stomach acidity, like the deposite morphology. And the one by one, I showed how they indicate carnivory, all of them. It's not really surprising if you think about it. Because yeah. I don't think that anybody will argue that we did not eat animals. So we must, we must yeah. Uh, yeah. have been, must have gone through the evolution of being able to consume meat. And this is what we find. Now, the question is just the degree. That's why I like, for instance, this acidity, stomach acidity business, because it separates the omnivore from the carnivore and this uh, uh, adipocytes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, morphology. It separates the omnivore from the carnivore. Some of the things that I found separate them, some not. And also some of them can be attributed already to Homo erectus. Some of them are less uh, sure about that. And then I go to evidence that is uh, more more like archaeological evidence. 
But I don't limit myself to archaeology. Archaeology, mm-hmm. unfortunately, is not a very good source of uh, finding out the human trophic level. Unfortunately. I studied now, I think for seven years or so, archaeology to get my PhD. But then I found that it's not that useful in reconstructing uh, trophic level, whether we are carnivores or not. And the reason is that plants mm-hmm. residues don't survive as much as the bone residue. There are bones in thousands mm-hmm. and thousands of uh, human sites around the world. Almost every human or archaeological site. Some of them have only stones, or maybe a place where people just prepare the, the tools, or, be, or a place where, where the bones didn't survive, because they, to get calcified, to get uh, ossified, the bones uh, need certain conditions. But there are thousands and thousands of sites with bones. There are very few sites with uh, plant material. But even if we had more plant material, Mm -hmm. how do you know how much? The question is how much? So the the archaeology is really not that helpful. There is what, I mean, every time a researcher finds a plant residue in a teeth, or plaque, okay? There is a celebration. Oh, yes, they ate here, you see, they ate as if anybody yeah. object to the fact that they ate that. But then it doesn't, but that, that doesn't tell us anything about yeah. how much plaque. You know, plaque actually mm-hmm. accumulate more easily when you eat carbohydrates. So it's like look, looking under the, under the flesh. Exactly. Okay. So people have more teeth bones. For, for, of course. Yeah, if you find plaque, it means that they ate. Uh, uh, plants, most of the time. But how many teeth you have without plants? So the archaeology is a, two things actually are, or maybe even more, can give you some indication. First of all, is the stabilized tops that we discussed. But the stabilized. Yeah, well, okay, hit, but hit stabilized that again. Top, hit that just, the, I don't know if we hit that enough. The problem with stabilized top is that it's, it's about the earliest you can get is about 50,000 years ago. So we, we are talking two million years. So you're just, mm-hmm. and, and they are limited more or less to Europe because you need the collagen, you need the, you need some, you know, it can't be too hot and, and you need the right conditions for it to be preserved. So yes, you have a lot of information about the last 50,000 years in Europe. And this information is unequivocal, unequivocally coming up. I mean, yeah, it shows carnivory in every... Yeah, and it show, we mostly ate mammoth and reindeer. This paper says a lot of... You can see some really cool graphics, too, in the paper that I'll include in the show notes about... You know, it shows visually where we are on the food chain and that, that humans are the high trophic so, level, you know, mostly so carnivorous. this is a stable isotopes. There are other things with the stable isotopes. Uh, it's not the time to go, but there are other technical problems with it. Uh, you have to get, it's better if you get uh, the stable isotope mm-hmm. of all the animals around you, the herbivores and the carnivores, because sometimes you can have high stable, high stable isotope just because of the environment and not because of what we, so there are some uh, mythological problems with the, with this isotope uh, business. But another thing that you may find is people that say, yes, this isotope just measure the protein, but we can still eat a lot of plants. And they want to register because they don't have a lot of protein. What people forget is that the meat, the protein comes with fat. Mm. So if you take the calories, yeah, of fat into account, there's not much room left for plants. Yeah. Oh, go into that really quickly because we didn't hit like how much the ratio of fat to protein, that protein's kind of limited. There's only so much protein you can eat, (laughs) right? We we were fat hunters mostly. Information about carnivory from archaeology. When you realize that we are limited in the amount of protein that we can consume to about 35, 40% of the calories, okay? Some people say more, some people say less, but let's say, just for argument's sake. So you see a pattern that uh, humans prefer to hunt prime adults. Now, this is a completely crazy strategy from a predator's point of view, because the prime adults are the animals in the herd that are in the best condition. They run faster, they are more dangerous, they are more alert, and no 
predator actually choose prime adult. Uh, Cursorial predators like wolf, they will pick the a young or the old because they have to chase them. Uh, lions will just ambush yeah, and easier. whoever comes yeah. first will, will get caught. But humans pick mm-hmm. the prime adults. So this is doesn't make sense unless you realize that these prime adults are always fatter than the young and the old. And by the way, you see in mm. various seasons, and you can find what season it was in the archaeological record, in various seasons, humans choose uh, males, and in, in other f- seasons, they choose females. Now, if you look at the, and this is a contribution of my friend Jay Stanton, if you see there is a, in certain mm-hmm. period of the year, the male have higher fat content just before the rat. And then, uh, but in most of the time, the female have the higher fat content. So the only reasonable explanation mm, yeah. is that they were looking for fat. Now, why would they look for fat? Because of this protein. If you eat uh, 35, 40% protein, you have to complete the 60% from either fat or carbohydrate or both. Now, the fact that they are mm-hmm. actually spending more mm-hmm. energy because they give, they just, if they find an animal that is not fat enough, they just don't hunt it. They just give it away. So they are losing energy. It's not, mm-hmm. it's, it's very energe- energetically expensive, this kind of strategy. So why would they lose energy? Or why would they spend energy to get fed if they could get it from plants? Then the answer is that they could not. So they would have had hmm. to spend much more energy to get it from plants than from yeah. animals. So they consumed animals, but they consumed the fatter animals. Now, of course, they didn't care about the age of the animal. They just care about the fat on the animal, and we find the uh, prime adults. This is how, from archaeological record, uh, you can actually get some information about the carnivory or the level of uh, the trophic level of uh, humans. Yeah, I think it was. You also mentioned that just the fact that humans have such a big capacity to store fat shows that we were going hunting for animals instead of using plants because. If we didn't get the animal, if we had a failed hunt, we could last on our fat stores for longer. Unique things about humans is that we have higher fat reserves than other animals. Higher fat reserves are, of course, better as a buffer when you don't uh, find food. But animals don't have unlimited fat reserves because they have either to chase or they have to uh, flee. So they just can't, can't afford to have a lot mm-hmm. of fat, to carry a, a lot of fat around with them. Humans carry a lot of fat, and we can afford to because, first of all, we don't chase. But there's no way that we can actually chase an animal. They're all faster than we are. We also don't escape because <laughs> there's no way we could escape uh, from a lion. But we need yeah. the fat to bridge. Okay, this is our, our, our advantage. We can consume large animals, which are less uh, prevalent in the environment, because we can last for maybe two, three weeks without eating at all with the, such high fat reserves. And this is the reason why we have fat reserves. And this is, mm-hmm. a, in my opinion, can be interpreted as another sign that we rely on large animals. So mm-hmm. the other, the other type of evidence that I've been using comes from paleontology and zoology. Paleontology, look at the environment. They look at the ecology, and they look at the carnivore uh, guild, and they look at the herbivore, and this is what these people do. So Lewis and Verdelin, two researchers, found out that about 1.5 million years in Africa, the carnivore guild, the one that hunt large animals, okay, the large carnivore guild, yeah, all of a sudden lost a decent amount of its members, while carnivores that hunt smaller animals didn't lose. Uh, there was no change there, and there was no change in the, in the herbivores as well. They figured that this means that humans came into the guild of large carnivores. So again, these people don't have anything to do mm. with paleo. They don't care about vegans or anything. They just do their research. Uh, and they tell you that humans <laughs> became, uh, yeah. when they were members of the guild of large carnivores. Now, from there, you can go to zoology. 
Zoology is what happens today, so they look at animals and what animals. If you look at a large carnivore, I mean carnivores that weigh 70 kilos, 50 kilos, 40 kilos, up to, I don't know, 500 kilos, almost all of them hunt large animals. And almost all of them are hyper carnivores, apart from one or two species of bear. Okay, bear is a, some species do, I mean, like a, a polar bear, which is a full, is a fully fledged carnivore. Some bears eat, you know, salmon and, and, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of, uh, you know, whatever. Berries, berries. and all this. Mm-hmm. Apart Bear, from these yeah, two yeah. Uh, species, all the large carnivores are hyper carnivores and they eat large animals. And if you look at the mm-hmm. animals or the carnivores that consume large animals, all of them are hyper carnivores. I mean, these two bears are out of the picture because they don't consume large, large. Uh, so, like, it's really so simple yeah. to think. So, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to understand. Hunting large animals and relying on large animals is not something you do for fun in the afternoon. I mean, this is like uh, <laughs> the whole structure, mm-hmm. the whole uh, society, the whole sociology, so whatever. Everything has to be geared. There and once you get the large animals, you have a lot of food. Well, and, and I don't remember if we said it specifically, yes, but yes, the, the yes, larger yes, the yes. animal, the higher yes. proportion of as fat. General, as right? a general, it's very yes. clear that this is uh, yeah. true. Everything, everywhere you look, you find the evidence that we are we were hypercarnivores, and this is our evolution, and we are at the very, very well adapted to eat meat and fat. Uh, yeah, I wish people could see this paper. I hope it gets published soon. But you have a table at the end, which is really a great way to summarize this and visualize this. All this evidence you talk about into just a simple thing where you say, does this indicate we are a higher trophic level or lower trophic level? And you take each thing, indirect evidence, the energy, the brain growth, that's positive for higher trophic level, neutral for lower trophic level. Stomach acidity, positive for higher trophic level, negative for lower. It breaks down each one, AMY gene, the APOE gene, the insulin resistance, gut morphology, all these things that you're talking about, isotopes, the lithics, the dental wear, the paleontology. It's not 100%, but from what, what you've broken down through you know 12 pages of references of all these papers is that the vast majority are positive for the higher trophic level carnivore and the vast majority right, are either right. neutral or negative is, uh, for the yeah, lower trophic yeah. level. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll, it will get published for sure. And uh, we will see what the reaction is. Yeah, yeah. Um, from, you know, people, there are many, there are many uh, paleontopologists who don't agree with it, who think that, uh, you know, the diet was uh, the, actually the human mind was uh, created so big to maintain the flexibility. So the flexibility in the diet is our strengths. Okay. And this is what, what uh, kept us going. Mm, and this is why we are spread all over the world. You know, I don't think that's the case at all. I think we are spread all over the world because we can hunt animals from one kilo to six thousand kilo. And they are, they are all over the world. It doesn't matter. Right. We can hunt animals from the size of an ant. I mean, a lot of populations so, yeah, for any collect size, ants and eat and, them or whatever they can find. This insects. is the thing. When you go to a, to a new environment, if you are dependent on plants, you have to learn the plants of the new environment. And you have also to get adjusted to them. But to hunt one animal or another, what's, what's the difference? So the widespread of humans, mm-hmm. by the way, you know, humans are, of course, the widest spread species, the second widest are wolves. And what do you know? Wolves also hunt a very, yeah. very wide range of uh, weights from one kilos to 1,000 kilos. So yeah, if you hunt, if you are mm. a very good hunter and you can hunt with flexible in your hunting, but... you will always find an animal to hunt everywhere. Yeah. Well, speaking of, wherever humans went, the, these giant elephants and... Yeah, that's another... P- I didn't everything talk about that. In the paleo- I have it in the, in the paleontological uh, chapter. Yeah, today it's becoming more and more evident. And you see more and more papers that claim very bluntly that humans were responsible for the extinction of the megafauna 
you know, during the Paleolithic. Like you said, what they show the dynamics of human population of, uh, uh, you know, when they occupy new territories and what happens to the, to the animals there. Islands is a good example. In islands, wherever humans get to an island, the large animal disappear in a matter of, uh, you know, a few years. But uh, also in America and also in Australia. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't think there's, you know, there are some people again saying the weather, you know, the climate. But if you look at the, there's one paper mm -hmm. that I show a slide. This is something that it's better shown in a slide, in a graph. Uh, you know, it's an economist. I like graphs. Right, right, right. I think I'm this is an an ancestral yeah, health yeah, yeah. symposium lecture. Yeah, yeah I, re I know, remember if this. You image. Don't, if yeah, you yeah, see yeah. this graph and you still think that humans had nothing to do with the extinction of large animals, you are really something. Because for 65 million years, the size of animals, the mean size of terrestrial animals, went up from the size of a mice, a mouse, yeah, 65 million years ago. This is where, when the extinction of, uh, of dinosaurs. So Dinosaur. mammals were yeah, like yeah. a mouse size at that time. And it grew up and up and up and mm -hmm. up continuously. This weather, that climate, no climate, yes climate, it didn't matter whatsoever. It grew and grew and grew and until it reached this 500 kilos two and a half million years ago. And then in two and a half million years ago, it drops to the same level that we had 60 million years ago. Okay, it Straight drops down. like a stone. I mean, why would it? Yeah. There was no such a big change in the climate. Yeah, I don't think there is a much argument. That I don't see how can there be much argument today that humans were responsible for. Now, you don't do it. This is another thing that you don't well, do in the afternoon, like a hobby. If you are responsible for the extinction of most of the large animals that ever walked on this planet, you know, during your lifetime, to half to two and a half million years, it means that you were dependent on them and that you consumed a lot of them. Yeah. I think there's other factors. It's possible there's other factors too. I think we did heavily hunt these, but I mean, a lot of people talk about this younger Dryas impact like 12,800 years ago over North America, and then that could have done, yeah. you know, gotten rid of some of the megafauna. But yeah. I mean, that's only in North America. This is, and that's, this is like a small thing for them. They survived 65 million years of younger Dryas and older Dryas and older Dryas. Yeah. You know. it's, 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 it's not it's not serious. The extinction, by the way, started in Africa, yes. apparently, six, seven hundred thousand years ago. Okay, we, we know, we talk, people, uh, researchers are talking a lot about the late quaternary megafauna extinction, which started about 50,000 years ago uh, in Europe uh, and then continued in America and, and in Australia. But actually, in Africa, there is data that shows that by about 126,000 years ago, 126,000 is like the late uh, Pleistocene uh, period that is, has a name. So that's why it's 126. By that time, a uh, mean size of animals in Africa was 50% of what it was expected to be. And the uh, researchers say the only yeah. reason that they could think of is because they were humans during that period. So, and there are other, other uh, uh, papers that uh, show the same yeah. thing especially in Kenya, uh, in two sites in Kenya, uh, that show that uh, there's a turnover of animals. In other words, it's not the same species. And the new species are smaller than the older species. Yeah, so there's uh, the decline in, in, in size started maybe seven, eight, hundred thousand years ago. It's the work of uh, the Homo erectus. You talked about so much evidence for this high level of carnivory. Do you know... Just to be fair, do you think there's any good evidence okay, showing that this. we, you, you know, had more plant matter? My, my analysis, I just relied on other people. You know, there is a period, it's called the Upper Paleolithic. The Upper Paleolithic started about 40,000 years ago. And if you see what, uh, what defines the, the Upper Paleolithic, it's really like the increase in science of consumption of plant food. This is, you see, more stone tools, you see, actually, the, for the first time, stone tools that are specialized in plant processing. In short, you see a lot of science 
that, that there's a higher consumption of, uh, of uh, plant food. And this is to be expected because if the animals, uh, large animals are getting extinct, and this is what happened during the Apopaleolithic, what do you do with the fat? Where do you get the fat? It becomes very difficult to get the fat. So your alternatives is to develop technologies mm -hmm. and a way of living, by the way. It's not just technologies. You have to give up some of the mobility. You have to become more sedentary because these two tools are large. Okay, stone mm -hmm. is not something you can carry around. So you see more sedentism. You see special tools. You see more signs of, uh, of consumption of uh, plant food. So yes, domesticating is about 10,000 years ago. Yeah, 12,000 years ago. Plant food. Uh, but, yeah, like but before domestication, they already started to become sedentary and to grow food, even uh, not domesticated. And then, uh, of course, they started domesticating plants and animals as well. And by the way, domesticating animals, one of the domestication patterns is for more fat. That mm -hmm. was one of the, because again, domesticated animal doesn't have to like run away cows? from, she's being guarded by humans. So she, she can develop, uh, yeah, you get it can develop more. Fat. So yes, there, there's more consumption of plant food as we approach the agricultural revolution. But this is also when our okay. stature this went down, our the, bone yeah, size and our brain size went down. With the agriculture, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things happened, yeah, yeah. The brain size went down, yeah. So it seems like this is when we became unhealthy. I mean, Jared Diamond famously said that agriculture is the biggest mistake in human history. This is when all our modern chronic disease problems started. So, well, for one, so people who talk about all these more plants are good. It's, well, if we look at the history, this is when our health declined. So why are these plants so good? Yes, if this is yes. when <laughs> we took a turn for the worse. People are idealizing plants. I mean, uh, just think about all these paintings of this uh, wheat uh, fields of, uh, I don't know, Van Gogh and, and things like that. Whereas before in the in the yeah, yeah. caves, you find the paintings of a uh, mammoth. Oh, I heard you talk about that in different languages, high I... means plenty of fat. Oh, Lion, yeah. Okay, in, okay, uh, okay. Saying hi or hello, like in the... Okay, um, no, this Mayan, isn't the Andes. The Mayan god like translates the uh, into god of the Maya. Of I don't remember the name of the god. And the Andes, yeah, yeah. But actually, it translates to a lot of fat. So in, in the Andes today, they actually say yeah. the name, that name, as good morning. This is their good morning. So just imagine the uh, in the Andes, everybody going around says a lot of fat, a lot of fat, a lot of fat. <laughs> I know a lot of people who would who, I have another paper who would say, which is agree uh, with that right now. It was published uh, what in 2016, I believe, 15, about the symbolic value of fat in traditional societies, and with all of them, it's so so positive. It's like the actually the essence of the world. Uh, in some cases, it's fat. All the fertility, everything that's associated with fertility, fertility. Is a synonym. Fat is a synonym for fertility in like I don't remember maybe fifteen languages that I found. All of them, fat is synonym with fertility. So and all, all kind of uh, things like that. So the symbolic value of fat in, in traditional societies is only positive and very very common. Many cultures they say if real food. If we don't have right. plants, are considered right. Right. what we eat. Right. If we don't have real Look, food, they ask the Hadza what foods they prefer. Now here, I must say, I can accept it because it's not like quantitative uh, analysis, okay? So the first food actually was uh, yeah. honey. And the second yeah, was well, who meat. wouldn't like a bunch of honey? <laughs> and then came the seeds and the tubers yeah. came last. You know, it's it's definitely like, it sounds like it's a fallback food. Yeah. My biggest, one of my biggest questions is why are fallback foods considered today the healthiest foods that we can eat? It's just so weird. We're just so backwards. It's like we just reversed it. Why do we consider fallback foods as this panacea now, this like healthiest thing yeah. we can eat? It's very odd. So yeah, did you say any of the data pointing to the heavy plant eating or not? I mean, was there any just in your research? Just I mean, we found some black. No, I'm just saying. I, I, the, only, the only thing I can say is that in the Upper Paleolithic, in the last forty thousand years, you see 
more more consumption of plants. What exactly what it was is uh, you know in terms of percentages is very difficult to say. We can say you know because of the stable azotope, we can see that uh, it didn't really have a, a large effect on the trophic level in Europe anyway until very recently, until maybe ten thousand years ago. Or at the beginning, it wasn't uh, a lot. And by the way, that's another sign for me that before that, they didn't consume large uh, quantity of, of, uh, of uh, plants. If they consumed more plants in the upper priority, you have to say that they consumed less plants before, right? Unless they consumed completely different type of plants that we don't know about. For instance, in Morocco, in one cave, they found consumption, high consumption of, uh, of starch about 15,000 years ago. And also high case of uh, carries, a, a lot of carries in the teeth. Dental carries, yeah, dental carries. So, yeah, dental carries, cavities, yeah. So, yeah. same thing with the Egyptians. So, uh, you know, when they started eating a lot of grain, there was a lot of dental carries and cavities and atherosclerosis. Look, there, there must have been situations where people consumed a lot of plants on a temporary basis in a certain location at certain time, but. It's, it's irrelevant, you know, to our question. What is the question? The question is, what are we adapted for? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm always thinking. We can survive on many things, but how are we going to thrive? How are we going to do best? What are we best suited for? And I'll bring this up again, this study, this major correlates of height in 105 countries, where they show that the more plants people eat, the shorter they tend to be. And you can look at the whole globe and you can see that as you go north, more north and people are eating more meat and they're taller and they're generally healthier. And so I don't see why people want to point out, oh yeah, but look at this population, they eat mostly plants. I'm like, great. Well, they're surviving. That doesn't mean they're thriving. I'm not saying it's not possible. No one's saying it's not possible and no one's saying we ate 100% meat. We're just saying this is how humans are best adapted and this is how we do well. Yeah, you can read the Western Price about his uh, problem. He, Absolutely. How he described these uh, tribes that uh, uh, feed mainly on uh, animals as they are bigger and smarter and what, uh, more beautiful, whatever. He's going out of his way to, to, you know, to describe them as ideal. Yeah, well, I talk about Western Price almost every episode. So as we wrap this up, I talked to you before and we talked about McCarrison. If you want to kind of do that, I kind of like that as like a closing statement. You brought up him. Yeah. Well, the Carrison was a doctor in India, an English doctor who was sent to India. He showed the net for research and especially about food. He was very impressed with, uh, I forget now the name of the tribe. Uh, they were so healthy that they really didn't visit him that often. That gave him the idea that food is the major cause of uh, health and disease. And after the war, the First World War, by the way, he, later on he became a sir and uh, a general, major general, general, I'm not sure. He became so, he was so famous and so, uh, contributed so much to our understanding, not to English understanding. Anyway, after the First World War, the English realized that they really didn't know what to feed their soldiers. So they set him up in India somewhere in Bengal, with uh, a lot of uh, assistants, you know, that kept a lot of uh, mice. He took like six more, I think nine diets of many people of India and fed them to the mice and saw and measured how well they grew. And we discussed that before, right? The one that grew more, the most were the six, the one that ate the six diet, right? The sick, you know, like, mm -hmm. And the one that grew the less were actually the Bengalis. He said, okay, so he's going to keep his stock uh, mice on the sick diet, and he's going to take like, I think something like 2,000 mice and feed them the Bengal diet and start autopsy them one after the other, two and a half years, which is like 55 years in terms of human life. And he lists the illnesses that they found in these autopsies. And it's like a long list of illnesses and it starts from the head and it goes all the way down to the foot and, and the eyes and, and what have you. The only difference, and by the way, these mm -hmm. old stock mice, no, not a single mice became ill. 
so that was his conclusion was, and I think this is a good proof that food is the major cause of health and disease. Uh, later on, he went and he yeah. even did some statistics about the actual humans of the Bengalis compared to Bengalis and the Sikhs in terms of uh, illnesses and showed that it's the same in humans. Also, if you if you look at the pictures of the Sikhs and the Bengalis, you can see the difference between them. It's unbelievable. Like you can put two Bengalis mm -hmm. in one Sikh. It's so obvious. I, I, it's yeah. crazy that people just don't realize that. And just in the modern world, we kind of don't think about what we eat. And I probably talk about this on every single episode. But yeah, that's a great sort of example of how important it is and what, it, yeah, there are no other factors. All the other factors are the same. I, re I looked up that experiment and, you know, every single thing was the same. Of course, like, you know, any good study is you keep all the mice exactly the same in each group, but the only difference was the diet and all these health conditions and diseases developed. So, right. Another, interesting thing, yeah, another point that I forgot to say is that they were in cages, in small cages. They didn't have to do any, any exercise. They could not do any exercise mm -hmm. <laughs> during that uh, two and a half year. Neither the stock one or, or the other one. They were brought outside for about one hour to catch the sun. So I guess they had enough with the vitamin D, but uh, that's it. They didn't uh, just die. run around. Yeah. No, no exercise. Yeah, just that. Well, oh, you know what? I forgot one thing we should bring up is... I think you listened to my episode with Mark Sisson and he was talking about how we should be making half our plates plants and all this stuff. And there's a lot of people in our community. You know, we have our little community that believes in this nutrition and that kind of thing, but it's still divided. A lot of people are still saying we should be, you know, meat is good, fat is good, all that, you know, grains are bad, processed foods are bad, but they're still saying we should be eating half our plates of plants. So what do you think about that? I think it's uh, it has no justification whatsoever. I mean, uh, people like plants, and they, you know, I, I I used to eat a lot of salads, and I like salads. I like, by the way, my favorite food is the uh, potato. Mm -hmm. But I haven't eaten potatoes for ten years now. Mm -hmm. So you know, people like uh, like salads, but to glorify that into something that is uh, you know necessary or ideal. This just doesn't, uh, there's no facts behind it. I think, by the way, that uh, cucumber should be the target of a campaign to eliminate because you you don't get any, almost no uh, caloric value for, and, and there's so much damage to the environment that is caused by moving it around the world mm. and growing it. I think it's the most useless plant ever. Because mm, mostly cucumber. water anyway, right? It's not really yeah. nutrients, yeah. Maybe only surpassed by, uh, you know, by uh, kale or something, hmm. by all these leaves. <laughs> ah, it's useless. It's, 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 there's no need for that. Yeah, that's you know, funny, but going it's back. It's crazy. Who the, thinks that, you know, that in, in the, during evolution, we said, okay, we now have this uh, mammoth here, so let's get go get some, uh, <laughs> some leaves and some, you know, potatoes. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's funny because it goes exactly back to the optimal foraging theory and the Stefan Guiana and the Hadza. I didn't quite yeah. mention this part, but the Hadza wouldn't even go after any leaves. Like you're, you're talking about, you're an economist. There was no return on investment on these leaves. They did. They went after honey, meat, and tubers because they had. They were worth the time for the amount of calories. Leaves yeah. you don't really get a return on investment on. A cucumber is just a leaf. <laughs> it's a leaf, you know. It's it's a it's a type of a you know round leaf. Yeah. In terms well. of content, caloric content and and uh, vitamins, whatever. It's just a waste of time and money. Well, I'm kind of heading that direction. Although you know, people talk about the phytonutrients and the flavonoids and all these different things that are plants. I mean, I can save this for another nutrition expert, maybe who studies this because you're Yeah, more... that's not my area at all. Yes. But... I hear the word flavonoid and I just stand and I, and I you know, I stand up and I fall. <laughs> well, if they're so important, then why didn't we have them for all of history? Because for yeah. all of history, we were avoiding them because they were toxic or they gave us no calories and we had no time for them. So if they're so important, then why do so many populations thrive with just meat and potatoes um, in the you history know, and modern? It, there's evidence. I don't. I couldn't find it in writing. I, I never seen it somewhere killing uh, elephants in uh, Namibia or something. Uh, 
cowling, you know, like there were too many of them. Mm -hmm. So they gave one to a son group that was sitting near a water hole. For one month, this group didn't do anything. They just sat down and ate this elephant. Mm. Okay, they didn't bother to <laughs> look for anything else. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. And that's also another good indication of why our stomachs were so high pH is because right. we right. would take maybe a month to eat an elephant, but it was okay because we had the right stomach acid and the right tools to right. deal with that yeah. bacteria. Yeah, we, could, we could dry it and we could preserve it somehow and also even have high meat. I mean, we don't need cucumbers. <laughs> we don't need arc system like cucumbers. Not healthy. Well, all right. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't care if it's cucumbers, but uh, don't don't glorify it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> don't glorify it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, eat your plants if they work for you. If you like them, if you like the taste, I you know I like the taste. I mix it up yeah, sometimes. Okay. Yeah, I have a little bit of salad. You know, I make like sardines. It's like, I want to eat some sardines. So maybe I'll just cut up some lettuce and put some balsamic vinegar. I can tell you that I moved, when I moved from keto to carnivore, that's what I actually uh, eliminated. I eliminated the salad, mm. more or less. Because on keto, what can you eat in keto? And yeah. first of all, I dropped two kilos, which I didn't need to, because I really, I was uh, I was not fat at all. Mm -hmm. But I, dro I dropped two kilos. Wow. And the second of all, I became even more energetic than I was before, and I was quite energetic. On wow. the, on the, on the and game. that's just from dropping the salad. Yeah, just from dropping the salad. Maybe I should do that's that because personal experience. Well, Michaela Peterson came on the podcast and talked about how when that was the only thing she was eating was the meat and the salad, and she dropped the salad, and every single thing in her body got better, and all her pains and no, depression and anxiety and aches and everything went away. <laughs> I tell you, what's happening with this carnivore diet is very, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, even to us, with all this McCarrison business and all the, all, all the research, even to me, it's really fascinating to see the results of just eliminating every single piece of, of uh, plant food and concentrating only on meat. It, it, the results are unbelievable. I don't think that, uh, everybody needs to do it. Yeah, yeah. But if you're sick, Yes, exactly. If you're sick, not everyone needs to do it, but if you're sick, if you have any kind of condition, consider it. It's pretty amazing. I've heard great things out of Paleo Medicina, if they're still called that. Where are they? In, in yeah, there's another name, but since then, nobody can uh, remember it. All right, well, what about this? We didn't talk about this yet. Can you say this last part again? I want to see if I can pick up. Just say that, start again when you talked about that you looked for the other evidence of plants and couldn't find any. Okay, you know, you asked me about plants, about couldn't I find some some high consumption of plants somewhere sometime? I must tell you that I actually was looking for it very, very carefully because I did want to include some more balanced picture, uh -huh. more, more, you know, to include the other side of, of things. And I couldn't. I just could not find any data that will show a lower trophic level, okay? Something that is sustained, something... Not a, an anecdote here and there. Yes, you can find an anecdote of, you can find, for instance, you can find in Geshev Not Yaakov in Israel, it was a very, very unique situation where the 800,000 years ago, the site was underwater. So underwater, things preserved much better. And they found apples and uh, grapes and uh, I don't remember, oh, a few other things. Okay. Yes, but what does it tell me? What does it tell me about the quantity? Of course, they would eat grapes if they had. So I just could not find. I'm sorry, but this is the this is what it is. I hope that when it get published, people will go out and find and put and make the picture more balanced. If it's if it actually is more balanced. But yeah, what about all the people talk about all the people ate like 800 varieties of plants in this? You know, these people ate like such a variety. Oh, something. Yeah, they say. One of the arguments is that uh, when you find the residue in teeth, okay, in the plaque, so there was an argument that look how many species you find in the teeth. It means, for them, it means that, yeah, they ate a lot because they ate a lot of species. But look at us. We eat what? Wheat and potatoes, more or less, for most of our calories. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we don't have many species. We eat one species. And the, the Hadza, for instance, if you take the Hadza, they eat something like 700 different species of birds. Mm. 
Okay, but birds are a negligible part of their diet. So the number of species, <laughs> and the other, other examples in South America, and the Hatchi, another tribe, the more species they eat, the less it's part, it's form of their diet. So it just means that people take anything that they find. It doesn't mean that it's a, it's a large part of the diet. That's a good point. So yes, it's very difficult to get uh, any type of evidence that will that they have a lot of plants. Let's put it like this. Yes, more plants in the upper Paleolithic, yes. Uh, even some evidence that Homo sapiens uh, was capable of eating more plants. Maybe. It's mm-hmm. like, it's a maybe. It's, it's about the, the, the ME1, about the, the salivary amylase. Oh, yeah, the amylase gene and that the digests gene, yeah, starches. Yeah. yeah. So, so it developed in, in number of copies increase in Homo sapiens. But when exactly, who knows? This is actually an indication of a higher consumption of carbohydrates. I don't know. It's a little, uh, but uh, yeah, so there are some, but generally, no. The, the evidence, I'm sorry to say, I could only find, you know, most of the evidence is uh, for high level of quality. Yeah, when you're looking at all the evidence and the hard data, it all points to this high trophic level. And that you can show yeah. anecdotes and stories that show some plants or some, you know, more recent people. But when you're looking at the breadth of data, for the most part of human history for two million years, it shows high trophic level carnivore. And it shows our genes developed in a much different environment. We are humans are fat hunters. We are high trophic level carnivores. And that looking at modern hunter gatherers is an absurd way to make guesses at what we ate for millions of years. So that's that's my recap there. <laughs> you know, there's one, ah, there's one, one piece of data justify a mixed diet. So this is a, a dental wear. So what they do is they take the teeth that they find in the site, in the archaeological site, and compare the wear. Yeah, there's micro wear and macro wear, all kind of wear, and compare it to a known population. So if they have a population that they know ate a mixed diet, so this is the shape of the wear mm-hmm. on their teeth, and they say, okay, this is the same, so this group, God knows, maybe 200,000 years ago, also ate a mixed diet. So I went to the paper that they put as reference for the groups that are supposedly have a known diet, okay? Like more recent groups. And none of the paper actually show that diet. When they say mixed diet, you go and the author defined it as the animal dominated diet or something like that. Mm. And they say animal dominated, sure, it's not 100%, so it's mixed. But you see see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, The other one, a mixed diet in California, tribe, I think called Shamuz or something. And then it, you go to the paper and you see that this paper is about talking about an island off the coast of uh, California. I don't remember the name of it right now. And uh, it talks about fish and about no mention of plants or, <laughs> or mixed diet or nothing. So you say, what the hell? I mean, they don't really. It's such a, you know, my, my when I did it, I attributed in the PhD and my uh, professor said, look, you know, you write it in the PhD, you must be sure about it. So go back and check. This is not normally done. So I went back and I checked and I said, this is it. They just, a dental wear doesn't tell you anything as far as it stands today. If they do it in a better, better way, you know, maybe it will. But right now, and like few days ago, I saw another study, a dental well, again, indicating that there was a mixed diet by the same author using the same reference group. Mm. So it's a, you have to go to the details. Science is a, is a business of details, many, many details. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the details, if you look at them carefully, to me, show a very clear picture. Well, I tend to agree. Anyway, let's wrap it up. This is awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. I will, I'll put out a bunch of links to all these papers we mentioned. Hopefully your paper will get published soon. You have a blog, paleostyle.com. Uh, you're on Twitter, uh, Bendor Mickey, I believe. Yeah, right. Awesome. Thank you so much. And you're welcome. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Bye. There you have it. We ate meat for all of human history. 
Again, I'll see how concise I can make this. Get your own grass-finished meat at nosetotail.org. Support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash pqman. Pre-order the film at foodlies.org. Watch highlights from the film on the Food Lies YouTube. Get daily content on the Food Lies Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Sign up for the newsletter on sapien.org. Get on the waiting list if you're a health coach, doctor, or other healthcare practitioner for our health technology at sapien.org. Or just go to saving.org and find links to all this. Stay happy and healthy, my friends. Thank you.